Hello everyone, today we talk about the trials against the Scipiones and the Roman takeover of the Hellenistic world. Uh, two um, aspects that are deeply intertwined, as we will see now, in this uh, early 2nd century BC, in the same generation actually of those that had fought and won uh, the Second Punic War and that were to expand uh, Rome further, in fact, in the in the following decades, and that were thus opening the herbs to a dimension, to an horizon that uh, up to that point, of course, the Romans had not quite uh, pictured, at least in the practical extent of, say, crossing the same Ionian and uh, invading Greece, for example, and or uh, essentially putting themselves uh, above the same successors of Alexander that, as you know, had been the model for any other power uh, in the Mediterranean, in Europe and, and beyond. Uh, there is much about the political background of Rome that deserves uh, another video, so we will talk just about the sort of persecution that the Scipiones underwent uh, by, uh, at the hands of their, of course, political rivals, uh, with dynamics that mix, for example, the initial, say, reactionary um, uh, attitude, right, of the great, especially of the great landowners in Italy to the necessity of establishing the empire, at least as we intend it, in a uh, political uh, category, that is to say, to bringing the Romano-Italic Confederacy to conquer and rule over other peoples, right, uh, across the sea. Um, it's something that, uh, in spite of that deep sense of Roman greatness that we have documented uh, since the, the previous centuries, deeply ingrained, deeply, uh, deeply felt by the same uh, Romans, um, was meeting this, resi this resistance, essentially for reasons of, uh, say, fear, right, that some of the Roman uh, senatorial clans could essentially take over the system. So this, what we would call re Republican regime that was mostly just emerging in the sense that every great um, Roman was, um, had to maintain that, uh, the, the loyalty towards the city by essentially maintaining the, the cohesion uh, of the of the establishment rather than seeing even those who deserve more to rise as new kings and it's interesting that we made uh, a while ago a video about the Sol Invictus but it's really uh, in in the sense of um, the sacred royalty right and what this meant for the world we are habituated to think in terms again of a Rome was a republic. It wasn't truly really a republic. Um, it it was in in as much as an oligarchy again r r had retained a sort of anti um, monarchical and or at least tyrannical uh, idea because the sense that the rex um, sacratus I mean those properly that had to still officiate the the sacrifices. Um, uh, within the same Roman magistracies, the Pontifex Maximus they are maintaining as literally he who, as he who build the bridges that brings humanity to the other side, being a royal prerogative, but being scattered among this uh, this elite. So it's obvious that we're talking big things because I never even made a video about the Second Punic War yet, but we will get there, and you have an idea of how how big, in fact, the the effect of Rome this this thing was, other than just the, the the actual conquest so you have um, an immense input right coming with that output uh, as well and the Hellenistic models um, of monarchy essentially that had existed since Ale Alexandrian times were at odds in a sense with the conservatism of the Roman oligarchy regarding the I think something even Alter. We today we use the term conservative, just saying right wing. But it means some just someone who wants to conserve something. But you have to understand even there what is that they want to conserve and how and why. So it's not necessarily continuistic 
individuals like Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus at this point. So he who had, um, uh, in fact, brought Carthage um, to uh, to heels in front of Rome, and that had also somehow transfigured, had had allowed her to continue existing in the in the same under uh, within the same Roman orbit, and that had thus sort of inverted the process of the tonic Pelasgian sort of feminine telluric etc uh, principle to to prevail once again after that the Indo-Europeans had uh, brought uh, this concept down in the very bowels of Europe right in the civilization of the mother essentially a communistic one during during the Bronze Age now seemed and this was felt of course even in the later uh, imperial theology as the the major accomplishment of Rome the um, the inversion of the human decay, and so the the reestablishment of a golden age was somehow yet to come, and because Rome was at least now, albeit extremely powerful, still torn internally on the further direction it had to be taken for all these various reasons, and and that's where the Scipiones come about, right? Uh, in 189 BC, a plebeian tribune accused Manius Achilles Glabrio, that was at that time a candidate for censorship, to have subtracted a part of the loot uh, that had been collected after the victory on the Seleucids at, uh, at the Thermopylae Pass. Right? This is the, the Syrian invasion of Greece, you know, at that point Rome and Macedon had had been uh, defeated uh, the, the previous decade at Cunus Cephali, opposed um, the uh, the expansion, in fact, of the uh, strongly revived Seleucid Empire by its uh, uh, king, uh, Antiochus III, a hell of a figure. Um, I should maybe start some sort of uh, Hellenic Hellenistic history, a bit aside just from the military stuff, we made something about the Seleucids, but let's say there is always time to improve. I talked about the Thermopylae. If you're interested um, in the specific battle, we will make another video dedicated to it, right? But in that one, uh, regarding the uh, confrontation between the Manipular Legion and the Macedonian Phalanx, it's like the, the top <laughs> topic. It's a huge video, but you know, two hours and a half. The, not even excessive for, for my standards, as you know. Um, but um, let's say it, it's a very interesting battle, right, where the Romans tried to, to break through the, the, uh, the, the Seleucid phalanx at that point, sort of showed even an important degree of flexibility, opening the ranks or closing it, as at Magnesia that we will see later on. And um, how the Romans won is essentially that just um, Cato, that we will discuss now, had. Um, there was uh, one of the other commanders under uh, Glabrio um, simply found, because that's how you win at the Thermopylae, another way behind uh, the pass and at the mere sight of the Romans appearing on that top um, the the Seleucid phalanx broke right, and the Romans won. And this had been a major deal because it paved the way eventually to uh, to Magnesia, and so these were the, the years, that, as we'll see now, that's also why the, the Africanus was later uh, blamed for his role uh, there uh, next to his brother Lucius. Um, so it was a clamorous Roman victory, but the Roman oligarchy was worried really, that um, these victorious commanders, so who had deserved the Imperium by divine right, um, had abused essentially of their own power given the laws of the um, of, of the res publica populi romani, uh, that is to say um, stepping uh, over uh, prerogatives that actually, as we will see now, had not really ever yet been defined clearly so uh, there was a sort of lot of gray areas around there because Rome was not really a statistic uh, system exactly because of this powerful 
aristocracy you have essentially these guys taking matters in, in their own hand of course it's a heavily developed at this point um, civilization it, it, it is regulated it is um, sort of disciplined and that's also why these trials began to, to appear but obviously they were motivated politically uh, the accusation, by the way, uh, to Glabro by the tribune was confirmed by the same uh, Cato's uh, witness, right? Um, he uh, had already been himself a consul, right? So the highest military uh, office, right? At magistracy in Rome. Um, and he had, uh, at that point... Uh, to before the, the war in, in Greece, that the, the Seleucid invasion, he had himself elected on purpose to the relatively modest um, office of military tribune. We've seen them uh, just recently, even in the, in, even if it was about the early empire, but the, the career, say the, the various, the, the chain of command of the Roman army. So these were important figures, but not the ones in command, like Labrio. Um, by way of the entire army, right? So they con they commanded just parts of it. And the reason why he had wanted to be there, even in this subordinate position, to his opponent, we will understand now why he was, was to, in fact, spy on how the command would behave regarding the right, of, say, the loot distribution, etc. That had some traditional mechanisms to, to be disposed of. Um, and it's evident that Cato was just there to control Cato's work. When you win, there are obviously a lot of riches open to you because everybody passes from your side due to deterrence, you have all these support, and and the Greeks, as we will see now, began to, of course, look at the Romans in a way that was unequivocally mirroring uh, the their, at that point, Hellenistic um, view of power, right? The Romans had effectively already taken over this area, hegemonically, right? They had defeated Macedon. They were now, again, in control of the, the, the Atlantic states, uh, politically. Um, and so, together with this, uh, they, um, the... The, the fear that such uh, Hellenistic recognition that would parallel Alexander to some degree, and so the recognition of divinity proper in a monarchical in a monarchic sense was rendering uh, certain elements of the Roman establishment fundamentally jealous of other people's accomplishment, and especially the ones of those who had uh, pushed historically for the expansion outside of Rome that were the so-called Hellenists and especially the Scipiones and their friends that had essentially expressed habitually that sense of um, of need, let's say, of to of Rome to, to expand but to change also, right? And hopefully favoring the same military commanders as the new great Hellenistic uh, heroes, right? On the wake of, of Alexander because that was the standard for everyone involved, um, for obvious reasons, um, and, and without any doubt um, or wavering, right? So that's also um, how truly individual the, the sense of power was, right? The Romans didn't have a problem to recognize Alexander as, as the, the god that he had been, and they wanted to emulate him. That this is a light motive that continues on with Caesar, for example, it, etc. Um, so, we understand if you look at the, list at, at the history of Rome, this attitude was, uh, say, a, a refraining from further expansion was counterproductive, was always pushed by those who actually wanted to maintain a more sclerotic system within, within the empire, right? because they didn't want to give the citizenry as such more power than just a few oligarchs were already increasing their power just by the way, for example, the Iger Publicus was distributed to various offices uh, con connected with in fact, the, the rule of other people really were, but that were jealous, of course, of the accomplishments of those who could um, 
out, outclass them, and so prefer to restrain even the Roman order. Now, there is a positivity in this too, because of course, when this uh, say monarchy would be uh, affirm, say affirmed, there there could have been the the risk that the same monarch could have tried to avoid this sort of feudal. Um, process to, to spread in turn so this is a light motive of Roman history this was not even clear the time in which Rome could be ruled by a monarch right as it happens from the Principatus onwards de facto um, but again the, the Romans were so close to the the traditional idea of you know being able to conquer the world and to in this sense transfigure it and to become gods themselves so finally achieving the the ultimate purpose of mankind that um, it was difficult not to say to stop them especially now that so much power was at Rome's disposal and literally the most powerful Hellenistic kingdoms were giving way under Roman pressure um, so this is a quite fascinating context the plebeian tribunal uh, accusation was effective however, to the point that Glabrio was obliged, basically, to withdraw his candidacy. Uh, and uh, following that, he basically disappears from the political scene, right? And his enemies, essentially having obtained the results that they had proposed themselves, renounced to continue the trial as well, right? Um, so it, it, it's all very clear. Right, you have a, say, a, a, a simple check and balance system that is able to, to prevent to this uh, rise to the top. As we have already said before, uh, Manius Achilles Glabrio was a friend of the Africanus, right? Uh, and so the attack against Glabrio was just the prelude of a systematic demolishing action led in the following years against the very Scipiones. So the reason of such hostility against this, this branch of the Gens uh, Cornelia cannot be a simple disagreement on foreign policy either. Right? Actually, we do not have um 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 say even a, a hint that this is the case for this set of trials it could be could be the many factors were overlapping but uh, we don't have to think just like for other times in Rome's histories that, that there were especially as, uh, about this oligarchy actual categories that could not overlap in terms of political interest right sometimes you say ah the uh, the optimatus and the popularis the, the narrative of the late republic there was no difference between them, right? The only difference was the means through which they used to obtain what they wanted. But they were, first of all, very cohesive in that sort of ultra uh, nobiliar power, by the way. And so you can't quite see much of a difference in that regard. We will we'll get to that part, of course, of Roman history, um, hopefully. Um, so it, it's important to stress also this this other dynamic um, because it's likely that the um, novus homo, Cato, right, and thus with him um, a part of the most traditionalist nobilitas, and so we see how actually people of this kind could different background could get along, were worried um, and in a sense legitimately it was just a different view again on what was their interest but they they respected uh, the general um, uh, traditional uh, meaning of it all uh, so the, the success of, of the Africanus and so the idea was that they could check it as much as he could check them so that's why we have all this uh, conflict Right, and Scipio had been, of course, uh, without any doubt, one of the greatest heroes in, in Roman history. Right, his connection with Jupiter was uh, very well known. Right, his auspices on the 
um, on, on the capital were just a spiritual ascetic preparatory phase for the beautiful, uh, perfect, marvelous campaigns uh, say of, of Spain and Africa. These people, these houses were really into the the, the imperial cult to a degree that um, it's difficult to, to explain to a 21st century person. And um, the guy had defeated Hannibal himself, right? And had always proven to be financially superior, right? There were other great commanders. Um, there is Nero, for example. The Battle of Metallurus really um, changed a lot of things um, during the war. Um, in terms of also tactical, strategical insight, there is surely more than just Scipio, right? But the figure, the leader, right? The, he who h held the Imperium had proven there, especially for his continency, um, to inspire himself to Alexander's model, right? It was this uh, very famous episode after the fall of Nova Cartago, where a beautiful Celtiberian um, noble woman had been brought to Scipio as a prey of war, right? And he refused um, uh, this virgin and gave her back to his fa her father and her uh, fiancé. In that case, of course, for proving Roman power to the Celtiberians, and now we're in the interland of the the Iberian possessions that Rome was seizing from Carthage was lot there, but the sense of say of justice of uh, say Scipio's Spanish campaign was perfect, you know. So he was really playing on that sense of divinity that had to. Um, of course, it was deeply rooted in the fides and in the in the right doing in what could in fact provide more divine power. To the guy that was likely inspiring himself to to Alexander, but was already seen beyond in a in a cult that was just basically the universal religion that everybody was aware of. And at that point, re let's remember that that's how the Romans got out, right? Of um, at least the immediacy of say the provinces of Sicily or Corsica or Sardinia, they really broke the war uh, in Spain. In, in uh, also in Africa in, in, to, to a much greater extent than it had done before. Well, of course, there were the episodes of the First Punic War, but especially the Hellenic theater now was something else, right? And especially against a power like the Seleucids that were fundamentally the most powerful of the Diadochoi, right? And also considering that Macedon herself, um, Alexander's land, had fallen, or at least was... Um, brought down by under Rome, right? Um, so the Roman aristocracies were admiring the guy, but were also worried, right? They attempted to prevent uh, those, say, uh, to the, the rise of those members that could prevail over others, right? And serious suspicion could be also caused by the fact that during the Second Punic War, Scipio, in fact, in that aforementioned episode, had been acclaimed um, as a king, as a rex, right, by the Iberian allies. And if you have watched that video uh, about, in fact, the about secret royalty, you know what rex is, as opposed to a king or king or this or that. It, it is really the 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 guy eternally ruling right um, the king of the living the sol invictus right this is the same reason why the the romans painted the the say the imperator the, the triumphing imperatoris painted by entering the, the pomerium their face red right and they entered as the the rising sun on the on with with um uh, a, um, a bigger with two white horses that meant that the black one had been fully transfigured and brought the spoils of war back to the temple of Jupiter to fulfill their own, in fact, divine mission, this temporary. So the, the, 
the, the idea of being of a Roman being um, put on a throne was was something that you it was not really allowed in Rome. This is also how it went for for a long time afterwards. I mean, even Augustus, um, by de facto becoming a monarch, would have never allowed anyone to kneel in front of him, like through the Perscunuses. It was also an, an Hellenistic thing, you know. But of course, he would allow in Egypt uh, the locals to worship him as a pharaoh, which is incidentally, by the way, the same Sol Invictus, uh, Ra, etc. So. Um, the and, and of course on that occasion Scipio had refused the title, right? He had uh, that that's what his true continency was about was not just respecting um, the order uh, of the world but giving merit to those who deserved it, but also not needing such uh, such recognition because it's as if he had not completed his full mission as a god in the first place, right? Um, he really boasted to be guided and protected by the gods, uh, by the forces um, stemming from the only and, uh, and, and one god. Um, again, the, the Jovian theology there is quite quite pronounced in, in Scipio's life. So, uh, the accusations against the Scipionas, uh, that in case you... It's, it's this branch of the Cornelia against it, seemingly stemmed from... Scipio means like... A, like a club, right? Like a uh, like a powerful sort of tall um, figure, um, and uh, what had happened in the war against the Seleucids, both in Greece and when Rome brought the war in Asia, right, on the same enemy soil, uh, were the had been really the greatest problem. Because that had been clamorous. Carthage was, of course, a major threat um, for Roman domination. Uh, Hannibal's actions were speaking by themselves, but let's say it was nothing more prestigious than the very successors of Alexander at that time. Um, and in any case, Carthage had been brought down now, and the east, in a broader sense, was the direction from which the Western conquerors traditionally, also in, in the Indo European mythology, etc., were to move, right, uh, to, and we will see this in, in some other video. Um, so, I don't know if you're familiar with the context of the Battle of Mag Magnesia, or say Magnesia, um, in Asia Minor, right, the, the great Roman victor that I also discussed uh, in that aforementioned video about the clash between the Manipular Legion and the Macedonian Phalanx, um, it's a more complex battle, but basically, uh, say that it, it, it's basically the largest army that the Hellenistic world ever brought against Rome, um, and they got defeated through in part the Pergamon allies, the fact that a chunk of cavalry reached the Roman camp and left the uh, the the um, the Seleucid phalanx uncovered so they had to form a square of pikemen and the Romans managed to surround them and the, the elephants that were sheltered within the, the square began to uh, run amok, to create panic, everything collapsed, basically just cavalry um, the Seleucid cavalry came back, found the, the entire army, um, destroyed um, and the Romans won their big time, like the Seleucid Empire was re resized dramatically, became essentially a Roman client state. It was Pompey that fundamentally first subcontracted it to other rulers, such as our, our say this had happened, and then it was dissolved. Um, we'll talk again more about the Seleucids at some point, but uh, the context there is deeper, because in the skirmishes uh, between the Romans and the, Le the Seleucids, um, before the main engagement, uh, the same son of Scipio Africanus had been captured by the, by the Seleucids. And Antiochus III, also known as the Great, and a, a man of definitely of a, of a great military curriculum to say the least, had of course treated uh, Scipio's son as a, a prince, as essentially an Hellenistic ruler, an Hellenistic prince. Um, and so enticing, say, uh, flattering the same 
Africanus because, of course, the Seleucids were quite worried about the Roman presence there, and um, he hoped uh, quite close of Italy to make a deal about the say the the, the political instrumentality of, of war of the armies that were facing uh, one another. This is before the Battle of Magnesia. Let's say. Um, interestingly enough, um, Antiochus had also sent Scipio's son back to his father without asking for ransom and on the contrary offering rich gifts by so increasing this um, say this this bond and this was obviously a big deal because it, it's essentially like the Seleucid king trying to corrupt a Roman consul right um, who was not even actually the leader of the army right the actual leader of the Roman army of Magnesia was um, Publius brother Lucius right I made a video about gravitas versus luxuria recently that um, that illustrates also the relation between the two in part and tells you also how much violently primitive and radically um, overloaded from a moral point of view the Romans really were at this point. Um, and so with which mindset they were arriving there? So they were not really going to be just flattered by Hellenistic monarchs because here the problem was of course that the odds were quite balanced and everybody was it was too much at stake literally the entire um, future of this enormous figure that had made Rome winning against Carthage defeated Hannibal um, who uh, later apparently Legion says at the same Antiochus court um, met with both the, uh, the, the Hellenistic ruler and Scipio Africanus and was asked you know how do you rank yourself Hannibal in, in uh, you know among the greatest commanders in history he said first Alexander then Pyrrhus, then me. And then Hannibal was asking, what if you had won at Zama? Right? That was... Yes, Hannibal was, again, a, a, a military genius, but the conditions at Zama were so bad that, that there was not too much that he could do. He did well, but he didn't have enough forces, essentially, in quality, especially to to win over the Roman legionary uh, veterans that Scipio had managed to redeem, right? Some of these guys were the survivors of Cannae that Rome had sent in exile to Sicily because she, she was ashamed of them as losers and Africanus gave them a chance and they won big time. So it, it's immense as a just all this legacy, imagine put at stake at every step of the way, of course, just including those ones during the Second Punic War, but now also against the Seleucids, and from the other side, the, the Hellenistic um, Empire risking to essentially to disintegrate, uh, as it happened, by the way, um, after, however, a time of big pro uh, power under Antiochus. So it's obvious that there would be these, uh, these contacts, these negotiations, and this sort of flatterings and political, um, say, mix. Uh, and uh, Publius, by the way, uh, before Magnesia, in this episode with his son and Antiochus III, was sick. Right, he was feeling poorly, um, and he was um, just communicating uh, via um, via messengers, of course, with Antiochus, uh, and he basically suggested with a friendly message. Uh, the king to give up to the Romans, right? Given that their superiority was already known to him, he said. Uh, and so without attempting the the risk of a battle, this is what Polybius um, and Diodorus say. It's a very interesting aspect of this all. Um, instead, the battle happened, right? Uh, and the Romans won. Um, but this private correspondence between a Roman senator and a foreign and enemy king, by the way, appeared as a scandal among the, establishment, the Roman um, um, aristocracy, right? Uh, where those who really couldn't uh, would exploit this 
especially in the wake of Scipio's victory that really was scaring the hell out of them. Um, this was not licit. Um, on the other hand, the guy had the Imperium in a way or another. Right? Even if he was not in command, he was thought to be divine to the point that, say, the Holy Ghost had descended um, even beyond, uh, say, let's say, to him through his own brother in command, that's Emilia. Um, some enemy voices insinuated even that Africanus had advised uh, Antiochus to uh, wait for his garrison and he uh, his own uh, say going back to the camp before fighting right Levy says this at least that basically implied a promise um, to act even in favor of the king and so um, a betrayal and this was a much bigger deal so during the the peace negotiations furthermore the Scipiones had cashed from Antiochus 500 talents as a sort of anticipation on the indemnity and um, they had used these to pay a double salary to the soldiers without uh, asking for an authorization from the Senate. Let's remember that the Roman soldiers did receive a salary, of course, even before Marius, uh, which I'm not going to explain now, but I presume that everybody is aware of this. In any case, this was a pay, um, and the term salaries is equally applicable, right? Even without continuity, that sometimes that wasn't even in the early imperial time, um, in a formally rigid form uh, way. Um, in I, it, so these events had been um, discussed at every level. Uh, in and just the, the fact that Rome had crushed the Seleucids had basically won over the Eastern Mediterranean. That's literally the, the moment in which Rome can save, even if the Ptolemies remained out, etc. But they were not practically a threat, right? So at this point, Rome starts uh nesting in the in the in the east starts interfering with this powerful um uh, polities that control the, the silk route that the, also the great marvels of the ancient world the same alexandrian legacy and so that was everywhere um as far as the relations between the the conquerors and the local communities were concerned because the locals were habituated to treat the ru rulers as this true new Alexanders and so gods um, and so the, the presence of a figure like Scipio in the East during these affairs and the voices that ran um, uh, around, revolving around his business were war um, so in 187 two tribunes backed by Cato demanded to Lucius Lucius Scipio that, as we have seen, being the supreme commander was the, the full responsible for it. And it was important to stress because he was the guy that had been conferred the imperium by the Senate and and the people of Rome, right? So, uh, if uh, the say the Roman order was the Roman hierarchy and establishment was to be recognized, he was the the one surely that truly and legitimately had become a medium with the divinity um, in a way or another even if this had passed through his brother first and then him but he was truly responsible under Roman law for what had happened in fact to present uh, uh, the senate with a record of the aforementioned donation of 500 talents there's not a few by the way while Lucius was uh, about to read the record, um, and his, to his credit, because of course you know, we have no idea whether it had been altered or whatever, of course there were ways to watch over the commanders even within again the administration. We've seen how Cato had infiltrated as a tribe, and there was a lot going on also religiously regarding these uh, international. Um, contracts and so it, as you can imagine in any age but especially more with such a high 
standard, right? Then Publius, his brother, stripped him of the record that he tore apart right in front of the Senate, deeming his request illegitimate, right? And perhaps um, he was not wrong either, right? This is this guy truly saying, you know, I won the hell, as we will see now, for Rome, right? And the lit literal hell um, for Rome. Um, and you ask me, right? And the, the, his posture, if anything, was considered arrogant because it was his brother that, by law, had to respond to that. And here we found, uh, we don't know whether it was staged or anything, the two were pretty close. Uh, there were a lot of anecdotes, legion, about this sort of, you know, divine hour re re revolving around them. And of course, only only Publius could, could even think to do such a thing publicly, right? Um, but it, it, it is true that the limits between the authority of the Senate and the power of the consuls were not fixed in a clear way. Right, we think of Rome as, of course, the, the great lawmaker, right? But this is mostly something that began to sediment in a defined jurisprudence in the early empire and codified in a, in a more systematic fashion in, the, in, the, in late antiquity. In the second century BC, everything was considered like, that guy is powerful enough, we'll let him do that. Like, if, if he actually receives that much power from God... Mm, what are we? Uh, why are we, aren't we stopping him? Were we right and were we motivated by uh, truly in a, a victorious fashion by our own ideas? This is something which I think most people should uh, come back to think um, in insight. Um, there was one thing again that, however, with his with his gesture, uh, was confirming in a sort of uncautious way, the accusations of a scarce respect for the Republican institutions. Thus, another tribune uh, instructed against Lucius, after this episode, a trial in front of the people accusing him of peculatus. That is, as you know, the misappropriation or theft of public or sacred property, which was both um, in, in this case. And the trial culminated with the condemnation to pay a heavy fine that inflicted the first harsh blow to the fortunes of the Scipiones. Right? It was a way, of course, to attack Publius through Lucius, but um, the Ro Roman law was sacred, so demonstrating that uh, at least, you know, the, the Roman people had deemed these guys to be um, committing such an illicit meant a lot within the same Rome because, again, if these guys had been so more powerful to go above the laws of Rome, right, what would Rome think of them? Right, even admitting that uh, the guys had carried out, again, this pulled off this major feat, right? But Rome was bigger than that, maybe, right? So it, it did backfire as an attitude, and um, the Romans were not kidding, evidently. The winner of the Syrian war would have thus spent in prison that time necessary to collect the sum to pay, right, the fine, uh, if it had not uh, come to his help, uh, the tribune of the plebs, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, the future governor of Spain, and we will see what he had, what he would manage to do there in another video. All right. And the interesting aspect of this is that while Tiberius was actually a Catonian, right, and so actually an opponent of the Scipiones, he vetoed the incarceration order, right? Some years later, Tiberius married Cornelia, 
daughter of the same Scipio Africanus. As you know, she was the mother of the, the future uh, Gracchi brothers, right? They had so much of a of a dramatic role uh, in the history of the the Middle Republic, um, and we'll talk about that on some other point. So th this relation ship is just to show you how within the Roman nobilitas the parental uh, links between the great families were often completely independent from political relations because they could respond to simple patrimonial strategies and then what would you do um, out there was something slightly different right so something more in the first case more contingental um, but this, even this uh, help could not really spare uh, the Scipiones from the ultimate uh, uh, misfortune because in 184 it was the turn of the Africanus that was accused uh, yet again by a tribune faithful to Cato to have had himself, um, to have let himself be corrupted by Antiochus' gifts and to have damaged the Roman interests in the negotiations with the sovereign. Um, he came uh, to the assembly followed by a thick um, rank of friends clients and he declared according to Polybius that quote was not right that the Roman people would lend their ears to those who accuse Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus because it's to him that those very people will accuse him of the free the liberty right in, in in speech that they could enjoy and this referred specifically to the fact that Scipio had saved uh, ideally Rome from Hannibal right so um, say if Rome has once for all put down Carthage that as you know Scipio did not even destroy while there were actually many of the same accusers that had um, even there sort of uh, attacked Scipio for not having for first for having wanted to carry out an enterprise but once that he had succeeded um, showing that it was actually a good idea the fact that he had spared Carthage that objectively at that point had become um, inoffensive after Zama right so the invasion was needed but uh, let's say the third Punic War as you know was just uh, it's not that it was military and eventful, but it was not much that Carthage could could do right in on the longer term. It was in many ways uh, uh, in that same video about um, gravitas and luxury I discussed the, the 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 destruction of Carthage, but also much more importantly the one of Corinth, politically speaking, because there the Romans were showing it was another time where right? you will see it, but Rome was a bit in crisis because of uh, the recruitment. Uh, collapse uh, record, a recruitment system collapse this inability to reform um, so paradoxically the fact that this say that the Roman expansion had not quite continued in the necessary way there are so many reasons for it the same second Punic War had actually caused this in part because of the bloodbath of Cannae the change in establishment etc but um, at least as a deterrent factor the destruction of Carthage was okay because uh, it helped just much as Corinth to, uh, to to eliminate some say hopes um, especially among the Hellenistic states but not only that Rome was just a kind you know tolerant ruler right the Romans wanted to rule and to rule um, for good so that's that's the way you go if it hadn't been for the fact that the situation was rendered necessary by Rome's crisis at that point. But again, we will see it on another, uh, on another occasion. 
uh, there was no doubt there was something shady that had happened in the East. Uh, Scipio had uh, surely his own mortality. And we will see how this um, this brought to the end, really, because uh, for that day the Comitium was um, spontaneously, in, immediately um, dissolved, right? The, uh, the, all the, all those followers of, of, of Scipio were enough to prove how powerful this man was, and the tribune that had accused him remained alone, so the Comitium was, was over. However, legally, the procedure did continue, so that Publius, that was really by now tired and, and bittered by uh, all this uh, inextricable situation, he had won Hannibal, but he had managed to, to win the same Roman system, and even in uh, in its uh, in, in some of you know, just from the within, some of, of its part, he essentially self-exiled to the Roman colony of Liternum in Campania, which was a sort of political surrender. The trial against um, Publius was abandoned, but generally speaking, it was really, really a, an important blow. And the um, Africanus, by the way, died uh, the year later. Uh, not really older than his 50s. So his son uh, was so uh, shattered by this that he renounced political career because, you see, if your father had failed, it was deeply believed that either you were as great as him uh, or more actually greater than him or you couldn't quite demand right anything, right? Um, so this interrupted by the way, it's quite tragic because it interrupted a secular tradition. There was, however, a change in this. Uh, that is the adoption of um, Lucius Aemilius Paulus' son. Right. Um, this had to do, of course, with the conquest uh, of Greece uh, in the uh, earlier um, decade. Um, and this took the name of Publius Cornelius Scipio Aemilianus. Right, so that after the interval of a generation, if you know, of course, the guy's history, you're, you're aware that he would bring again the Scipionis to the honor of consulship and triumph, which was a huge deal, of course, for this clan that kept right, being around anyway. Right, but this is how the the matter was settled. It was really a very harsh persecution that culminated with the the actual um, defeat of this the greatest commander of his generation beyond. Right, he who had to had wished to essentially become uh, Alexander's follower in, in many ways. Um, it's obvious that this, this Roman generals were not, of course, accomplishing the, the same that Alexander did, but of course was, there was something metaphysical about what had happened during the Second Punic War, as much as this Roman penetration deep into the bowels of the Hellenistic world, of the Alexandrian world. So um, this had been a huge deal for Rome, right? Even to cope with these commanders, because they had to be found a place that... Um, up to this point in, in the establishment had not quite existed as such. And, and actually at this point the establishment was also much um, softer compared to the one that had existed say in the 3rd century BC um, comparatively, especially before the Second Punic War, but so it was. right. The personality and the fortune that Titus Flaminius would have triggered the same suspicions that brought to the ruin of uh, Africanus and the Asiaticus. In fact, after his victory over Philip V, that brought to, as you know, the, the final conquest of Macedon by the Romans, uh, talking the Battle of Pydna, um, Flaminius had been cheered by the Hellenes with 
titles such as Theios, so divine, and Soter, that is savior. Right, this was the entire deal. Of course, again, Titus Flaminius was not uh, the Africanus, uh, even the, the previous accomplishments against Antiochus III were a bigger deal. Of course, having brought down, finally, Macedon for good was, uh, now that uh, also other powers around could not take advantage of that as the Seleucids tried to do, and again, the Romans were had really done well to preserve Macedon, even after Cunos Cephali as a as a centralized and autonomous kingdom. Um, and these titles were, in fact, not just proper of the Hellenistic monarchs, but they reflected, again, the, the divine rule that in Rome the establishment uh, was um, really distrustful towards. Some cities had even minted gold coins, so gold was, of course, the, the purest of all materials, the divine one, with Titus uh, effigy, right, and in other polis, he had been venerated as a hero, which again is something that the Greeks did just by themselves. They tended to um, to to deify even single uh, govern, say, certain um, um, officials that hadn't really done much else except having died, right? So there had been a scolarization of the system to some degree. This is true, especially for Hellas proper, right? Aside from the the, the Macedonian, the Theodokoi kingdoms, let's say. Um, and I explained this in that video about the rise and fall of the Hellenic civilization and an Indo-European interpretation, because it's... It's also something we have to come back as far as reasoning on. What, what is that, that that made Greece great back in the day? And why is that the Romans were taking over at this point? There is uh, a deeper reason than, of course, okay, the Romans won, is why did they win? Right, that's, that's the question. Um, Flaminius, you see, was a more modest individual, thanks to his caution in relation with the other noblemen, and also, in the use of his own authority, um, he protected himself from uh, accusations, right? He could have just ridden the wave, but he was more modest. And this was also positive, because definitely um, the Scipiones affair had been quite uh, intense, right? He had literally shattered a bit the... The established order, Rome had projected herself in a very few time on a much vaster area than before with this clan essentially in charge of the major success, receiving great popular support from the soldiery, so it was risky, right? But you gotta admit, as we have just observed, that say these Roman uh, generals were part, again, of a broader Rome that was able to control them, and this was also reflected in the degree by which they managed to extend their own their own personal power, but also the same one of Rome, right? Flaminius had crushed, again, Mass, had been a hero in that sense, uh, there was much of divinity he understood in the Imperium that, again, reverted to Jupiter, what uh, the, the the Roman oligarchy rightfully feared was that this power not to be restituted. And suspicion was so strong that uh, Cato, when he was censor between 184 and 183, expelled from the Senate Lucius Quinctius Flaminius, that was Titus' brother, and also humiliated the latter, um, denying him the title of Princeps Senatus, that would have actually been rightful by age, uh, and he conferred him instead to Lucius Valerius Flaccus. This is how bitter the resentment, the, the conflictuality, the, the different views, the different lifestyles, uh, and the, sort of the 
again this contrast between the, the the Roman sort of warrior farmer continental um, idea and the Hellenistic um, you know monarchic uh, luxurious um, sort of more even maritime dimension so it was really a difference in these wars we often tend to forget that right people somehow grow up with impression within western civilization that was just sort of um single way to civilization there wasn't right these peoples were remarkably different from one another and not just by sort of a empty sort of hierarchical mechanical stage of development they had different souls right and they had different blood they had different background they had different vision right um we have finally to remember that in 180 BC there was a plebiscitum proposed by the tribune Lucius Villius, hence the Lex Villia Annalis, that would definitely regulate the political career, the cursus honorum, giving a juridical sanction to norms that in the past had only been uh, customary. For the simple reason that, as we've seen, they had never been uh, regulated. They had never been uh, uh, drafted. There was an uncertainty about their interpretation. Completely normal, again, from for such. Still, an, after all, an archaic word like the Roman one, in spite of the opening to Hellenistic culture. Um, it's likely that uh, an interval of two years... Uh, between the most important offices, uh, edelship, rhetorship, and consulship, was rendered mandatory, right? So that um, only he who had been praetor could present the candidacy to consulship. So that edelship could not be considered a mandatory step of in, in the cursus honorum. Um, this was actually simplifying a uh, thing for you know, rising to the top in a way, but the the point being that, in fact, you know, we cannot get into the details of why mechanically it was the case, but obviously adults uh, had the idealists had much less importance than the praetors in the first place, um, and the former were elected every year in the number of four while the latter in six so this would automatically sanction at least numerically the fact that you could be elected just as a predator without necessarily having been an adult um, and it is certain that um, minimum age for the first time was established at 37 years old for uh, adultship 40 for praetorship and 43 for consulship which is fascinating in other words they wanted you to be a reliable individual they didn't want you to be too loaded right in sort of beautiful ambitions and uh, you know that Scipio uh, Africanus had uh, gained he had actually gone beyond uh, this previous customer limits that already existed but, but they had not been fully sanctioned as such, and so in cases of uh, of need and emergency, and again, the Second Punic War have been really a mess that required that, but it was also this constant political debate, to say the least, with ferocious struggle for preventing the signs of this or that client to get too powerful, to have too much ambition, in a moment in which the system seemed to be in crisis, by the way, with Hannibal home and so on. Uh, the plebiscitum was promoted by the group that had actually fought against the Scipionis and was practically aiming at rendering impossible for the future exceptionally rapid careers like the ones of of um, the Africanus and Titus I said Flaminius but it's actually Flamininus uh, another restriction was introduced in 152 uh, this concerned the impossibility to take up the office of consul more than once, which would have, as you know, in later times been just quite bypassed, but by so there, by the consensual um, 
taken since Wells with the establishment. So both laws were eluded uh, through legal means, by the way, uh, by the plebis quita, right, that accorded particular dispensations ad personam, right, the uh, restoration of the consulship was allowed uh, newly by Sulla. Later on, there you have essentially a necrotic status of the Republic itself, and we will see these as much as other important chapters, such as, you know, the the same third Macedonian war that we haven't discussed here, but um, say all what had occurred before as well, which is definitely the Roman entrance to this Hellenistic world, and I think it's it's important to understand in the internal as much as the external implications. All right. Um, well, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoy this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye